on today's World Insight, Trump moves to revoke Hong Kong's special trade status. Is Hong Kong's position as a financial hub in jeopardy? And astronauts aboard a SpaceX capsule docked with the ISS. Does this mark a new era in space exploration? Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight, coming to you live on CGTN from Beijing. I'm Tian Wei. China is working on enacting the national security legislation for Hong Kong. As a related decision was adopted at the national legislature, the deputies to the 13th National People's Congress voted overwhelmingly to approve the decision. Various local groups in Hong Kong have launched a movement to support the security legislation. The lost backer said it will improve the region's long-term stability. However, over in Washington, U.S. President Donald Trump announced he was moving to end Hong Kong's special status with the U.S., at least apparently. Therefore, I am directing my administration to begin the process of eliminating policy exemptions that give Hong Kong different and special treatment. My announcement today will affect the full range of agreements we have with Hong Kong, from our extradition treaty to our export controls on dual-use technologies and more, with few exceptions. Of course, he said a lot of things about how to punish Hong Kong, including visa restrictions and other actions uh, may follow, and also in separate moves against China, he announced a ban on Chinese postgraduate students believed to have ties to China's military while conducting research at U.S. University. In response, China warned of countermeasures to any foreign interference in Hong Kong affairs, with this message coming for Washington. China. The decision of the National People's Congress of China to establish and improve the legal system and enforcement mechanism for the maintenance of national security in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region is entirely China's internal affairs. No foreign country has the right to interfere. We will take the necessary countermeasures to resolutely oppose the wrong actions of external forces interfering in Hong Kong affairs. Hong Kong is an important area for the investment and operations of American industry and commerce. Washington has important interests in Hong Kong. We advise that the U.S. recognize the situation and stop interfering in Hong Kong affairs, China's internal affairs. If the U.S. insists on harming China's interests, China will take the necessary measures to resolutely fight back. So, what is Hong Kong's special status with the U.S. that made U.S. President Donald Trump keep on talking? And what challenges face Hong Kong when the status is revoked? However, what are some of the opportunities that could lie over there as well? Let me loop in our panelists in Hong Kong, our Xie Chairman and CEO of Gaofeng Advisory Company. In New York via Zoom, a little bit dark there. <laughs> uh, we have Anthony Chen, former J.P. Morgan Chase Chief Economist. And in Beijing, Liu Baocheng, Dean of the Center for International Business Ethics from University of International Business and Economics based in Beijing. Now, let me ask all of you, by talking about the economics and also about trade at this time. So, uh, Mr. Xie, tell me more about the general reaction now in Hong Kong after the national legislature adopted the decision to work on the legislature, legislator rather. Well, of course, you know you have different uh, factions in Hong Kong. Some of them are against the uh, the new law, and some are very supportive of the new law. Uh, I was, you know, I can say, you know, as a Hong Kong person myself, I was born and raised in Hong Kong, and uh, and been working here since I returned from the U.S. I say that I hugely support this law because. Uh, for over a year, you know, with the uh, anti-extradition bill uh, and all the riots and the unrest that has been caused because of that, and also all the other activities like uh, uh, subversion activities uh, in Hong Kong that has really made Hong Kong uh, very uh, uh, unstable and, in fact, almost ungovernable. So, uh, as a person myself, a Hong Kong person myself, I uh, look forward to this law. Mm. Uh, Mr. Xie, 
Let's talk about the economics, and that is the purpose of this discussion, because the politics have been handled in many of the various programs already here on CGTN. So let's talk about the economics. Uh, when the U.S. president threatened to take away the quote-unquote special status of Hong Kong regarding its relation with the United States in terms of trade and economics, what does it really mean for Hong Kong from your perspective? Briefly, if you can, for an introduction answer. Well, he wasn't very specific when he uh, spoke about that on Friday. And he mentioned things like trade and sort of uh, technology and so on. So I don't know exactly what he has in mind. My, my guess is he probably doesn't have much in mind when he was talking about it. So I would leave it just at that to make it very brief. And I can comment later if you have further questions. Mm. Let me go to you, Mr. Chan. Uh, you're joining us from New York. Uh, I hope people there are safe, uh, both from the pandemic and certainly from the uh, latest events. But let me ask you this time about Hong Kong, uh, Mr. Chan. How should we understand the banks, uh, particularly the uh, American banks, uh, financial institutions that are pretty much concentrating in Hong Kong in terms of their outreach in Asia, particularly to uh, China's mainland? Will they think about moving uh, uh, as the president threatens? Uh, I think that right now uh, such actions are premature. I think that the president was not specific, uh, as you heard uh, on Friday, about what actions he's going to take that are going to take place. Remember that this year, Hong Kong, like the rest of the world, is suffering like we are in New York City from this pandemic, and the economy in Hong Kong will probably contract this year anywhere from six to six and a half percent. And that is a sharp uh, decline from the prior year when the economy contracted by about 1.2%. Mm. So I think that uh, the United States has to be very careful when they make these uh, uh, steps because if you go ahead and act too aggressively with Hong Kong, you actually end up uh, causing more damage to the overall economy in Hong Kong. And I don't think anybody wants to see that. So that may be one of the reasons why uh, there were no real specific as to what actions that were going to take place. So my hope is that this is a lot of noise, but at the end of the day, the actions won't be as detrimental to the Hong Kong economy as one might have ex uh, expected after hearing those initial remarks from the president. Mm. I have a number on hand. Uh, uh, total assets, U.S. banks in Hong Kong around $148 billion. Well, uh, customer deposits was about 79 billion U.S. dollars, representing about 5% of Hong Kong's total banking sector. That's the latest number I got on hand. There might be some updates, but that was the idea. So, uh, Mr. Xie, uh, listening to those numbers, are they significant? Uh, if uh, uh, decisions are being made by American banks to, or financial institutions to move away over a long process, uh, to other parts of Asia or other parts of the world, uh, would that very much uh, have an impact on Hong Kong's uh, financial sector or being the so-called uh, the oriental pearl, which a lot has to do with the financial services? Well, the numbers are significant, as you just mentioned. However, the picture is not a static picture. Uh, as you also know, right now, actually, because of um, uh, some of the issues in the U.S., Increasingly, Chinese companies are coming to Hong Kong and get sec second listing mm -hmm. or seek the primary listing here in Hong Kong. So this position of Hong Kong as a financial sector is actually being strengthened with or without this uh, sort of intervention from uh, the U.S. administration. So I think the entire picture is, is a very dynamic picture. Right now, the U.S. bank's representation is quite significant, but over time, um, the other other banks or other sources of financial representation can increase. I also have to men say that uh, of of the American clients that I talk to, and I have quite a number of them here in Hong Kong, about uh, how they feel about this uh, uh, situation here, none of them have told me as of now they pl uh, they have any plan of leaving Hong Kong. Mm. At, at worst, they would say, "Well, let's see," but nobody said, "Well, you know." this is so bad that we're going to leave Hong Kong. Nobody has told me about that. Mm. There are a lot of talks and a lot of rhetorics uh, coming from politicians. Uh, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Liu, uh, tell me more about your thoughts listening to your colleagues. Well, uh, I think uh, in, the, in the first place, uh, whether the sovereign, uh, sovereign supremacy 
it's really there to, to prevail. So, uh, you know, that really runs seemingly into confrontation with uh, what uh, Donald Trump has been uh, proposing. So, uh, the, the, uh, the other issue is that, okay, uh, it seems to be uh, the very cost effective measures for Donald Trump to raise uh, his voice over Hong Kong pointing to human rights issue, pointing to the, threaten, uh, uh, the threat to the Hong Kong's autonomous issue uh, in order to bring uh, more popular votes because a lot of uh, people yeah. do not even know uh, what is uh, uh, but going you know, there in Hong Kong. My question really, sir, is more about the economics. We have a lot of political debates, all the reason being already lined out uh, through 24 hours of CGTN programming. Let's focus on the economics. This is really the matter, actually. So, Professor Liu, as yes. an economics professor or trade professor, do you have any intake on that? Yes. So, Hong Kong as the uh, financial hub and also as a shipping hub uh, is really evolving uh, in the globalization process and it is still playing a very important role, but uh, uh, there is a uh, this is uh, this affection among a number of uh, groups that are uh, uh, well uh, by uh, Chinese central government supporting uh, Shenzhen or uh, Shanghai etc that put Hong Kong into a rivalry position uh -huh. but uh, in the meantime we do see that uh, uh, they still serve as the hep, uh, as the hub for a number of multinational regional headquarters and uh, right now the uh, impact is not really immediate and they are still watching because uh, how China is going to launch this law and how China is going to implement this law yeah. uh, that's still premature and uh, in the meantime whether Trump is simply there throwing rhetorics or is he uh, going to uh, produce a slew of harsh measures over Hong Kong yeah. so that's still uncertain but so you know, businesses that's, that's, won't that's really, really the point isn't it right. I mean uh, you can see uh, the strategies of uh, President Trump. Uh, he has a strategy that is that he tried to throw hard things, or these hard words out first, and then try to uh, diminish the courage from the other side and therefore try to win as much as possible from his perspective. But, uh, you know, the question really is uh, whether uh, it's not about whether China will have uh, a watered down version of the national security law, but rather about you know, what would be the real impact of economics uh, if uh, the other side is taking actions? I think that is the key here. Uh, once these numbers are worked out, uh, I think both sides and all of us will understand what's the real nature of this, whether this really matters or not. Having said that, though, talking about numbers, let me read some for all of you, gentlemen. The Hong Kong government notes recently that over the past decade, the U.S. has become the country with the highest trade surplus in Hong Kong among its global trading partners. Between 2009 and 2018, the trade surplus surpassed 290 billion U.S. dollars. Although Hong Kong's imports and exports have grown steadily, Hong Kong is also a large hub for re-exports. In 2019, approximately 508 billion U.S. dollars in goods were re-exported, taking up to almost 99 percent of its total exports. So a lot of numbers there, mainly the meaning is U.S. biggest trading partner of Hong Kong in terms of exports to Hong Kong. And also Hong Kong is a hub for re-exports, almost 99 percent of those exported into Hong Kong already going out to the other parts of China or other parts of the world. So now, ever shift. Tell me more about what these numbers mean. Uh, the numbers means that actually the U.S. is in a major trade surplus with Hong Kong, and therefore, if um, you know the U.S. would like to increase the tariffs, uh, you can tell by the numbers, right? Most of the Hong Kong so-called exports to U.S. is actually re-export, and those re-exports are mostly from mainland China to the U.S. And so you would actually know that or guess that. You know, if there's any tariffs increase that's been caused already by the U.S.-China trade war, uh, that has been affected anyways. So the real exports from Hong Kong per se to the U.S. is actually a very tiny portion. Mm. So if the U.S. administration said, well, you know, let me increase your tariffs from whatever percent to some bigger percentage, the impact to Hong Kong as a whole wouldn't be that significant from that standpoint. Mm, interesting.
Uh, Mr. Chen, uh, you have a take on that? Yeah, that's exactly correct. Uh, we can increase the tariffs uh, to Hong Kong as much as we can, but the tariffs are from the originating country, and that's um, mostly mainland China and other countries, so it's not going to have that much of an impact. So I, I think that at the end of the day, everybody knows that it's in the best interest of the United States for the Hong Kong economy to do better. And by the way, it's in the best interest of China for Hong Kong to do better. Mm. China certainly has ambitions to create that greater Bay Area, which is going to include Hong Kong. So they really have the best economic interests of Hong Kong in mind. Outside of the political situation that I think is leading to this confrontation, everybody has to step back and realize that both parties want Hong Kong to do better. And when we take that into account, we realize that taking a deep breath and, and certainly not rushing to judgment is the best economic strategy that both China and the United States can adopt. Mm. At this point, Professor Liu, uh, during the pandemic, economies have realized that there have to be two ecosystems for a country like China. And I guess maybe for an economy like the United States, you have two ecosystems. One is the ecosystem of trade that you have within your country because the borders sometimes can be uh, dangerous to open up from time to time depending on the virus. That's one ecosystem. The other ecosystem is international trade ecosystem that we used to have. Of course, now there are a lot of disturbances as a result of unilateralism and things like that, but still it exists. So how is China, uh, since you are coming here from Beijing, uh, looking at these two ecosystems and the threats coming from Washington, the elections going on, you know, how does all of these pictures work together or against each other? Yeah, very right. I think the, uh, uh, from China's perspective, on top of that, China also views whether it's a temporary uh, landscape or uh, whether it's a long-term landscape. So over uh, the pandemics, yes, there is uh, definitely uh, the rhetoric, so there are definitely the physical restriction over the mm. uh, free movement of all factors of production, uh, be it in technology, be it physical goods and service, right. etc. But uh, <clears throat> But uh, this is really an event that cannot really uh, blindfold uh, people's view over a long-term picture where, so global, what about Hong Kong yeah, in this regard? where global supply chain mm -hmm. uh, is uh, still the fundamental to support the uh, globalization fr process and support the realization of the economic value of innovation. So Hong Kong plays uh, still a very important role. So it's evolving. It's no longer a manufacturing hub, but it's still serving as a financial hub. It is yes. also a uh, terminal to uh, connect the uh, you know the global financial marketplace versus uh, uh, mainland China and uh, uh, also the rest of the uh, Asian region. So uh, that picture does not really change. And okay. also that uh, China is also uh, increasingly reliant on the re-export of Hong Kong given a number of uncertainties from Europe, from uh, uh, North America, etc. So uh, the Hong Kong's prosperity and uh, Hong Kong stability is really fundamental, okay. uh, either for global supply chain uh, through the new division of labor and realization of tech, uh, innovation, and also uh, for mainland China. Okay. Uh, let me ask you, Mr. Xie, uh, about some of the points the other two guests just mentioned. One is about technology. Uh, Hong Kong aspires uh, to play a role in terms of innovation. Now, that process is a bit delayed by the recent events over the past year or two. Uh, will a threat coming from Washington cutting off Hong Kong's access to new technology and, uh, uh, and a scientific development really going to hinder Hong Kong's future of coming in as a new kid on the, on the, on the block in terms of science and uh, tech industries? Well, again, you know, the details are not come out yet, but presumably the U.S. administration would do something along this line. I think the impact will be some, but not going to be significant. Uh, as you said correctly, you know, it looks like we are now developing two ecosystems in the world in terms of technology, a China-centric and a U.S.-centric. But even with all these you know, restrictions that the U.S. is now putting on the Chinese companies, like Huawei and all the other companies on the negative list, China is finding its own ways to develop its own technologies, albeit uh, more difficult, more challenging, but China is on its own way, uh, finding its own ways. 
I think Hong Kong would find its own way as well, even mm. if the U.S. decided to exercise whatever you know control or limitations they want to apply to Hong Kong. Interesting, uh, Mr. Chan. What about Hong Kong dollar, U.S. dollar? Now, Hong Kong, one of its uh, best qualities, uh, at least seen from the mainland, for example, is about its. Uh, uh, free access to the U.S. dollar and the exchange rate. Uh, what about that? Will that change? Well, certainly, uh, certainly a lot of people are going to be worried about whether the peg can be maintained. But Hong Kong has a pretty big war chest of $4.3 trillion of foreign exchange reserves. So I think for the moment, that is not a real uh, issue that we should be all concerned about. What we really should be concerned about is that we can get through uh, this process and realize that even though we are in fact creating two different worlds in terms of technology improvement, uh, economics tells us that in order to actually make progress and raise everyone's standard of living, and that is for the United States and for China, is to really pursue the theory of comparative advantage. And that is that yeah. countries should be working together, not against each other, because when you work against each other, both countries lose. Exactly. We hope uh, some of those in Washington that are listening to your voice and your opinions. Uh, you know, gentlemen, as Hong Kong's chief executive, Carrie Lam, welcomed the MPC, meaning the National People's Congress China's top legislature's decision on the national security legislation, Lam says she will work with the standing committee of the MPC to complete the legislation as soon as possible. She also signed a petition supporting the legislation. Take a listen. All this has jeopardized the security of the country and the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. I want you all to remember that national security is everyone's responsibility. We should fully support it. Meanwhile, political advisors from Hong Kong have issued a statement expressing support for the proposed new security legislation. By the way, these numbers are actually. Um, CPPCC members and also MPC deputies, meaning they are top advisors for China and also they are members of China's top legislature. They say without security, there can be no prosperity and stability in Hong Kong. They also say it is now essential for the central government to address the serious threat of Hong Kong's security and the lack of security legislation. And they call on the general public in Hong Kong to support the legislation. Of course, there are also different opinions going on in Hong Kong. We saw earlier some of the demonstrations in Hong Kong suggesting they would rather not to have a legislation like this. We'll see how the debate going, particularly the process of uh, the standing committee of the MPC, how it is coming out with this law and how it is working with the Hong Kong SAR government to uh, have the best version of it. Having said that, though, we are almost running out of time, gentlemen. Before we go, I do want your advice about how to proceed to observe Hong Kong from now on. We saw so many international media press coverage of one sort or another, a lot of rhetorical wars in social media. What is the best way, do you think, to look at Hong Kong? Uh, Mr. Chen. I think the best way to look at it is to see what this law really is telling you. It's telling you that it doesn't want subversion. It doesn't want treason. It doesn't want people disrupting uh, uh, the government in, in China or Hong Kong. Okay. And those uh, stipulations themselves are not unreasonable at all. The question is, we should take a deep breath and start to think about whether there can be trust between China, the U.S., and Hong Kong. Well, of course, Hong Kong is part of China. That is already in the basic law and the Chinese constitution. Let me go to you, Mr. Xie. Your final words, briefly, please. Yeah, I, 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 the NPC has just approved the framework or the structure of the new, new law. Uh, there's still a lot of details that need to be worked out mm. in between the NPC and also the Hong Kong government. I think the way to look into this going forward in the next few months is looking at the details of how the, des the whole thing is going to be designed okay. and whether or not this is aligned with the interests of all parties. Okay.
Mr. Liu, Professor Liu, final words. I, I think now uh, control is not really the final objective, uh, but uh, it's really how we can really build confidence with the global community uh, through communication, negotiation, or how, how, win, uh, how we can really win trust from the bigger majority of the okay. Hong Kong people uh, into uh, what is really lying in the future is more of promise than really control. Okay. Communication is the key, whether it is within China, which Hong Kong is part of it, or with the international community. Thank you so much for the three of you for joining us. Ever Xie, Anthony Chen, Liu Baocheng. Appreciate it. Thank you, gentlemen. You're watching World Inside, coming to you live from Beijing. Later in our program, astronauts aboard a SpaceX capsule docked with the ISS, International Space Station. Does this mark a new era in space exploration, public-private partnership between SpaceX and NASA? Welcome back. You're still watching World Inside Live on CGTN. I'm Tian Wei. Next, we take a look at the giant leap in space exploration. Two NASA astronauts have blasted their way into history books during the past weekend. They were sent into the space by Elon Musk's SpaceX rocket and later boarded the International Space Station. It's the first for a private company and the first in nearly a decade for NASA. Meanwhile, China is expected to launch the last satellite of its Beidou navigation satellite in June, completing its Beidou navigation system. The U.S. GPS will no longer be the only option for China, as Beidou is expected to provide a more accurate service. So, how do competition and cooperation play their key roles in the international space industry? Right before the launch of SpaceX, I talked to Professor Wu Ji, who is the former director general of the National Space Science Center at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. He congratulated the big step forward in public-private partnership for space exploration for his NASA colleagues. What do you make of the cooperation between SpaceX and NASA in terms of sending astronauts into the outer space, International Space Station? Uh, it is a new uh, uh, measure of, uh, of uh, 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 operation of NASA's program. It's called uh, uh, Public-Private uh, Partnership. So uh, uh, this is the first time that uh, a private company, a commercial space company, launch uh, astronaut, a manned space, to join the manned space program. So this is a very uh, significant uh, progress. And uh, to have a commercial company joining the government uh, agencies has several uh, reasons. One is uh, it has a uh, very low cost, much lower cost, uh, because uh, of the government agency is, uh, is belongs to the government. The government has to pay them and, and has to uh, keep them living. And so the agency became bigger and bigger. So it's uh, getting very heavy now since Apollo time. Uh, but the commercial company has much efficiency uh, working styles, so the, the cost of a uh, commercial company can be much lower. So to give the government a program to the commercial company can lower down the price. So this is a very significant movement. Fifty-five million dollars, I heard, it will be for one seat if this is uh, operating commercially. Tourists going to the outer space, wow, that's really expensive. Yes, I agree. It, it is a very high price, and uh, to my opinion, it should be much lower down uh, in the future. But this is the very beginning. So uh, they will start with this. Uh, this uh, quotation is also calculated, uh, including the launchers, including the capsule uh, retrievals coming back to the Earth, and also the operation of the space station, and all this add on. So uh, at the moment, uh, this is the price. But uh, we are uh, expecting a much lower price in the future because with this price, the space tourism cannot develop. It's too much. And only uh, the top rich people can, can, can do it. It seems that the outer space has been a source both of cooperation and competition. Therefore, Mr. Wu, what does this mean uh, for uh, U.S.-Russia ties in terms of exploring the outer space? Will they go once again back to more competition? Yes, because space is, uh, belongs to the whole human beings. 
So we have to collaborate there. We are not uh, fighting each other. But the competition is to have, uh, in order to have the better solution. So if you have a little bit competition, you will have a better solution. You will have a cheaper cost. Uh, you, uh, it, it will get you more efficient. So it's, it's not that bad to have some competition. But it should not be a war, should not be a fighting, uh, should not be a star war. So uh, competition collaboration is the way to make uh, space exploration uh, go forward. Mr. Wu, you've been in the field for decades. Uh, you've been participating in some of the mega projects China has been working on in the outer space. Uh, you know, frankly speaking, isn't this going to be more competition from now on as a result of geopolitics, even between the United States and Russia? We see uh, the U.S. president and vice president making a, a lot of remarks about the political significance and the national powers of this mission. Yes, uh, space is a very special uh, science and technology or even econ e economic area. It's very special. Uh, up to now, all, most of the, even uh, more than 80% of the investment to space activities are coming from government. So, and it's also quite uh, related with the defense technologies. So that's why uh, behind this uh, space technology is, is different government, U.S. government, Russian government, and the Chinese government to put money in, so they have to, so it's a very much depends on the geopolitics, uh, the relations between the country, uh, whether you can collaborate or whether you help each other, and whether you trust each other, so it's a very political. So sometimes we call this uh, old space. If talking about uh, collaboration and cooperation, what are some of the areas that countries still have the chance to do it? Uh, for example, between China and U.S., uh, between U.S. and Russia, uh, between China and Russia? It uh, totally depends on the, the, the relation between the governments. If the government want to use space as a tool to change the relations, they will do it. For example, at the, at the space race time, uh, during the Cold War time, uh, the U.S. government and the and uh, the Soviet government has uh, already decided to collaborate in space. They are docking the space shuttle together with the uh, uh, Mir space station, which is a totally Russian space station. So they docked each other and the astronauts working together. So because of that, they changed the scenario of the political relations between the two powers. So depends on the government. If they want to use space as a tool to change the relation, and to have uh, to build up a trust, it's, it is still a field to have a collaboration. Talking about collaboration, competition, China has been working hard on the moon mission, while the U.S. is uh, uh, aiming at the Mars mission, I mean NASA itself, rather than the co uh, commercial cooperation with uh, SpaceX. So, uh, Mr. Wu, uh, very different goals. Uh, uh, why the two are so different, and what does that mean for the two's uh, blueprint and the technological achievements likely to happen as a result of this? Uh, China is uh, working for the moon, and uh, we have a, a Chang'e missions, uh, several uh, successful uh, launches already up to Chang'e 4. So the, we have uh, launched four missions, and the end of this year we will launch Chang'e 5, which has a uh, lander and sample taken and, uh, 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 and uh, ascending and then docking on in the orbiter of the moon in the orbit of the moon and then uh, going back to the Earth and uh, so it's called sample return mission. So we, we put a lot of effort on the moon. But at the same time, China is also looking at Mars. We, are, we will launch this year in uh, July the first Chinese uh, Mars mission. So uh, Mars is also a target. But the technology develops uh, little by little. So we have to start from the moon and go to the Mars. For the U.S., they are much advanced uh, for Mars. They have uh, uh, dozens of uh, Mars missions, and this year they will have a very complicated, uh, a sophisticated uh, lander, uh, labor scientific laboratory on Mars. So uh, we will go together this year because uh, every 25 to 26 months, there's a launch window. So this year, there will be several missions uh, launching, uh, launch uh, for Mars mission uh, to go to Mars. So China will be one of them. 
Cold War, by the way, has been a phrase that I've been hearing quite frequently recently, which is to me quite sad, I'm sure to our viewers as well. However, during the Cold War time, we see uh, countries being pumping into a huge budget uh, for their outer space uh, exploration competition uh, programs. Uh, how do you think uh, China should think about the issue smartly and uh, make sure it is uh, uh, for uh, the most pragmatic benefits and also make sure it can serve as much as we try uh, a source for peace? Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, during the Cold War, there's, uh, there's uh, competition, a uh, very little collaboration. So when you have a competition uh, the, during the Cold War, uh, Cold War, you have uh, it's a kind of a game, and uh, with that game you cannot win. Nobody can win, so everybody is loose. Everybody put a lot of money on both sides, and uh, which is useless to have that competition. So uh, we should avoid that. China will never join this kind of uh, race. Uh, China, we we will go uh, along our own uh, program and we have our own plan, we will never, never, we will never compete with the other countries. We, we have our own uh, uh, development plan, so little by little. So we, I believe we, we are not inside this uh, Cold War or can, kind of a space race, any kind of space race. On the other hand, uh, Professor Wu, some argue, well, it was during the Cold War time that the U.S. Uh, managed to put astronauts onto the moon, the first ever moon exploration by human. It was during the Cold War time. It was also during the Cold War time that both the former Soviet Union and the U.S. been making tremendous progress in the outer space exploration project. Some could argue that even today, what we have now was based on the achievements then. So, uh, Mr. Wu, how do you see the other side of the argument? Yes, uh, that was uh, 50 years ago uh, when Armstrong landed on the moon, uh, moon uh, uh, representing the human beings, as the NASA said, but they have never go uh, performed the second step. So that's finished because it's a political demand. There's only political demand. And although they are, re they are holding a flag of uh, scientific exploration, but uh, it's, it is true, it's a political it was a political um, uh, action, so it's during the Cold War. And after they had the victory, uh, there's no demand. They have already won the war. Why should they win it again? There's no enemies. So that, that is why the human being stops there. So we, we, if there's no political drive, there's nobody, no government put that much money to send a man to the, um, uh, uh, to the moon again. Only now the, the drive is science, but uh, the budget for science, for each, even for the U.S. government, doesn't have that much. They say they want to go to send uh, astronauts go to Mars, but that costs 20 years of NASA budget, 25 years of NASA budget, if they do any, if they do only this mission. So it's a lot. So it, it sounds even impossible. So that's why commercial space is uh, very useful to come in. We sometimes we call it a new space. The new space will be a new driver with a public, general public uh, demand. So, so this, this may uh, put uh, to have some new input and uh, uh, we will see some new uh, uh, actions later on. Uh, final set of questions for you, Mr. Wu, is about the current situation, COVID-19. In the middle of pandemic, uh, NASA and SpaceX, it seems that they were fighting against the wind in order to put the astronauts to maintain their safety and also health and put them onto the spaceship. Uh, so uh, how much uh, do you think uh, you are getting out of uh, uh, the current uh, situation in terms of COVID-19 vis-a-vis an outer space exploration trip? It is uh, very difficult to say because uh, we Particularly, U.S. is uh, under a very serious uh, situation now. The, the, the new confirmed cases are still growing uh, or vibrating. Uh, so it is, uh, it is uh, so dangerous to have any astronaut uh, get infected and then they get sick uh, inside the space station. And inside the space station is a very closed space 
and all the astronauts living there, and if one gets infected, all the others will get infected. So I'm sure NASA take a very serious measure of this. So the, the, before the astronaut go into space, they should have a very strict uh, quarantine uh, process, and uh, even longer than 14 days. So the, the, they should be very, very careful. So I'm sure they, they, they are doing it. I'm sure they are doing it much better than the public uh, situation in the U.S. Uh, what do you think you're going to expect and read out of this trip? Uh, as a researcher, as someone who's been working with the U.S. scientists for decades, how are you going to observe uh, this mission from the very beginning until it wraps up? I will uh, watch it uh, all the time, as uh, uh, start from the launch, and the most dangerous is the launch. So if the launch is successful, uh, I'm sure they, they have done very good uh, work, a very good job, and uh, I'm sure 99.9% .9 it, it will be okay. And uh, then after that, uh, I'm sure it will be even more safe. So uh, they will dock with the station, and then the astronaut will, will have activities there, and then there will be two astronauts coming back, and the retrieval is another a period of dangers, but they have done an unmanned test also several times, so I'm sure there will be uh, no problem, and uh, only if the astronaut landed on the ground, I will feel safe. 99.9 percent, .9%, that is according to Professor Wu Ji, the successful launch and cooperation between SpaceX and NASA. And that's all we have for today. If you'd like to see more, you can certainly search World Insight in the search engine or check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook accounts. I'm Ken Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. Bye for now.